Is that shut the door again? Welcome to this um, Conservative Home Fringe event. I'm Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, and for the next hour with you, uh, I will be in conversation with former Justice Secretary, former Work and Pension Secretary, independent candidate of the last election, most importantly of all, of course, Conservative Home columnist, Absolutely. Uh, David Gork, uh, who's back in Manchester for a Conservative Party conference for the first time in four years. So, uh, welcome. But before I um, ask you any questions at all, I just wanted to ask the room how many people have yet read or got a copy of the book that will be the subject of our conversation this evening, The Case for the Centre-Right? Anyone who's right? I just thought I'd test your knowledge of the book, as David will be doubtless testing mine when I ask him <laughs> questions about him. Um, so the very first question really ought to be a pretty general one, which is you've edited this book, which is a series of essays called The Case for the Centre-Right. So why don't you explain what you intended to achieve by putting it together and how you did it and when? Okay, well, I think probably I should start with the, the origins of it, and now is a good time to talk about it because it is precisely uh, a one-year anniversary when I thought... when I had, I had the idea of, of putting together a selection of essays. So we can all remember what was going on this time last year where the Conservative Party conference was just starting... We'd had Quasi Quarteng's uh, mini budget a few days beforehand. Things had clearly gone extraordinarily badly, and the conference was already unraveling. And I felt, uh, particularly at that point, that there was a need for those of us who came from a different tradition than either Boris Johnson, who has just uh, left office, or Liz Truss, who was just about to leave office. Um, but that wasn't completely obvious at that point. But I thought there was a need for those who was coming from a different tradition to sort of come together collectively and to make the case, to articulate that tradition, what it's about, uh, why that should be at the heart of centre-right politics. And so uh, having had that, that thought and talked to a couple of friends and colleagues uh, or former colleagues about it and saying, yeah, yeah, actually, I think now is, you know, we should start pulling something together. By, by pure coincidence, uh, I was then contacted by a publisher saying, do you want to write a book? Uh, and what they had in mind was just a, a book written by me, uh, you know, my sort of take on things. Uh, and I thought that sounds, one, I thought it would be better if we got a kind of gang together with lots of people writing something, and secondly, I thought it would be considerably less work. Um, obviously, corralling ten other people to sort of write a book uh, turns out to be quite a lot of hard work, but all the contributors actually were pretty easy to deal with, and I wanted to get a kind of range of issues covered. I hope what we've managed to avoid is essentially publishing 11 essays, all the same things. Uh, we try to cover a broad range. Obviously, there is some overlap. But the, the essence of it, OK, Liz Truss has gone, but I still think there is a very strong need for some of that sort of more liberal, more outward-looking, more internationalist, uh, moderate centre-right uh, view to be articulated. So just tell them who some of the main contributors yes. are. Well, actually, I, I will, I'll do a very quick run through of, of so the 11 contributors I've written the introduction which is the very much the easiest thing to do uh, Andrew Cooper uh, pollster has written about the realignment of British politics Rory Stewart has written about populism uh, Dominic Grieve has written about the rule of law and why that should be at the heart of centre-right politics uh, Gavin Barwell has written about Brexit, but it's more sort of forward-looking about what our relationship with the European Union ought to be. Tim Pitt, former special advisor, has written about the uh, economy. Uh, we have got Anne Milton, who's written about health policy. Sam Jima, written about science and technology. Amber Rudd, climate change. 
uh, and energy policy. Uh, and then we've got Michael Heseltine, who has written a sort of broad vision for the centre-right, focused on devolution and also a closer relationship with the European Union. Uh, and then it concludes uh, with Danny Finkelstein, who asked the question, well, what is the centre of politics and what distinguishes the centre-right from the centre-left? And, and some of you may have seen his uh, column in the Times last Wednesday, uh, which is to some extent a, a summary of that. You still need to read the full chapter, let me uh, be very clear, uh, but, but the essence of his argument is set out in, in, in that column. Okay, and next, just to set the broad terms, what do you think the centre-right is? So I, I think the... Um, I think I will, I will use the, 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 if you like, the methodology that Danny set out which is, first of all, you know, what is the centre ground? And he argues that it's not just a question of kind of splitting the difference. In fact, it is a, it's an approach to politics and policy that recognises problems are complex, uh, that we live in the world of trade-offs, uh, and um, uh, that you'll never, you'll never have the sort of perfect policy that won't have downsides. It's a question of balancing you know, risks, opportunities, and so on. Now, what distinguishes the centre-right from the centre-left, I think, is perhaps that the centre-right, almost by temperament, is more likely to be uh, more cautious and more sceptical, uh, more questioning about the ability of the state to solve every problem, uh, more sceptical that change will, in of itself, always improve things, that things can become... You know, worse as well as better, um, uh, and uh, you know, will 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 as a consequence not necessarily rush into the sort of big constitutional change idea. Change, of course, has a role, but we'll be a little bit more sceptical about that. Uh, will probably, when it comes to the economy, uh, be more. Uh, let's take tax policy as as one example. That the centre right will be more cautious. Uh, that uh, tax rises on the wealthy uh, will provoke a behavioural response. The left will be more confident uh, that actually this will raise revenue and that the additional revenue will be used in such a way as to bring benefits. But it's a question of degree. It is not, you know, no one on the centre left will say there is never to take that tax example. Uh, you know, the centre left will, will, will not be inclined to say there is never going to be a behavioural response. The centre right is, is, is never going to say uh, there'll be a complete behavioural response. You have to judge it on the circumstances at the time and you weigh up the risks. But I think the centre right, perhaps more sceptical, more cautious. Uh, almost by, by, by temperament. Okay, you've set out your view of what the centre-right is and you've explained who the authors are. So I want to start by a couple of questions about what is not in the book. Uh, and the first is a question about authors. Um, no George Osborne, that might have been, no Philip Hammond, no, at least in her, her second incarnation, no Theresa May. Did you ask anyone else to write in the book who... Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to run through every conversation. I, by and large, um, I got the people at the... The, the, the people who I asked um, are the people who are in this. There was one other person, not someone who you have mentioned, who I did ask to write a chapter and this person decided not to in the end. I did take a policy decision not to ask... Uh, any sitting MPs. Uh, there, I think there are sitting MPs who could have written uh, chapters in this and would have contributed quite a lot, but I felt it would have been potentially inhibiting for us and potentially embarrassing for them. And I, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want anyone who was sort of standing at the next election to have sort of words thrown to them, and I didn't want to feel in any way a degree of self-censorship. Um, but that was the sort of selection I had. As I say, there was there was one person who I, I was quite keen to get who I didn't. But um, people generally said yes. Can I then ask you about what's not in it in a second way, which is um, I've read most of the chapters um, and gone through the subjects. And it would be fair to say there are some gaps. So there isn't a chapter on law and order, 
for example. There's a chapter on technology, but there's not a chapter on education. There isn't a chapter on work and pensions. There isn't really a, a chapter on the Constitution. And these did seem to me to be quite large gaps. And is it arguable that with books of this kind, you end up fitting the subjects to the authors rather than doing what's arguably better, is if you're writing a sort of policy-based book, that you get the subjects and you then fit the authors to the subjects? We haven't tried to be exhaustive. I mean, I, 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 and I don't, you know, I don't, I want to be clear, this is not a, this is not a manifesto. This is not a, you know, setting out a, a, a manifesto for a kind of liberal centre right. Uh, and, you know, therefore there's a sort of, you know, when we're putting up candidates or anything, or any of that description. It's, 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 it's not that. And, you know, I, I'm, I, as I acknowledge in, my introduction and repeatedly say not every contributor will sign up to everything every other contributor has said. Uh, I mean, I hope that they'll sign up to what they've said themselves, but that's that's all we're really asking uh, from the contributors. I think there were, I mean, there were, there, you know, there were potentially other things that we could have covered, uh, but the sort of nature of this and particularly wanting to get this out pretty quickly, you know, there, there's, there is a slight danger of, of waiting to get the, the, the perfect person for the perfect position and you, know, you end up and then someone drops out and you kind of end up never actually completing the book. So uh, yes, I think there's uh, if what you're saying, Paul, is there's scope for a volume two. Um, I rather I, thought I, you might say that. I, I think there might be that <laughs> potential uh, depending upon the demand for volume one. The difficulty about asking you questions about the other contributors is, of course, if I throw particular quotes at you, you would be able to take refuge in saying, well, I think it's an interesting contribution to the, to the debate. So my next you, question... You say difficulty. I think that's one of the best attributes of editing a book rather than writing it all yourself. It's also one of the easiest attributes about answering the question if it comes to you. Yes. But um, could I therefore ask a, a question to you that you really can't answer on behalf of others, but you can presumably answer for yourself, which is, you've explained what you think centre-right politics is, and you have a collection of authors. Do you yourself now believe that the only practicable vehicle for centre-right politics in the UK is the Conservative Party? That's, I think it's a really, really good question and does get to the heart of it. And I think this is very much an issue where there are different views amongst the contributors. I mean, we have got Sam Gima as a contributor who, who fought for the Liberal Democrats. There are a few of us who are outside. I'm not a member of the Conservative Party um, and, and you know, haven't been for, for, for nearly four years. There are the majority, I think, are members of the Conservative Party. Um, the point I discussed this sort of specific point here and th this is a sort of somewhat sort of gloomy prognosis coming from the uh, from the liberal centre right perspective. Perspective, but let, let me let me state it anyway. It is very very hard to break through uh, uh, in the first past the post system, other than in the sort of two big parties. I have personal experience of it myself. As you mentioned, I ran as an independent in 2019 uh, and uh, one of the things that, that sort of struck me talking to voters then was that in, in many, many cases what they had in mind or the, you know, the question they had is, and the hardest question I ever got was, uh, at the end of this general election either the leader of the Labour Party or the leader of the Conservative Party is going to be Prime Minister. How does voting for you an independent help answer that question. Uh, and that is that, yeah, that is the problem that the Liberal Democrats have faced, it's the problem that independents face, it's the problem that smaller parties generally face. And that, that is very, very difficult under first parts of the post to break through in those circumstances. So that would suggest, actually, it's about recovering the Conservative Party. Uh, and I say in my introduction, as I think you know, the most straightforward way of the concert of of pursuing liberal centre right values is to recapture the Conservative Party, and a large number of the contributors will will say that completely wholeheartedly and and full throatedly and say yes, absolutely, that is going to happen. Um, 
I would also say, however, that I think it is going to be hard for the Liberal centre-right to recover within the Conservative Party in the immediate future, that my best guess is if the Conservatives lose the general election, which is uh, looking at the polls clearly more likely than not, the likelihood is that the Conservative Party will go further in, uh, in, in, in or will go in a populist direction, uh, or it will go in a kind of ideological, dogmatic, low-tax direction, and it's unlikely to move in the direction I would want it to. Uh, now, there's a sort of certain question: Is does does you know, will eventually the Conservative Party uh, change tack? Will the electoral pressure become so great uh, that eventually it moves in the way that you could argue happened when David Cameron became party leader in 2005, as has happened to the Labour Party twice? after Michael Foote, and then ultimately Tony Blair, and then Jeremy Corbyn, and you can see Keir Starmer moving in that direction. Now, does, you know, does the wheel turn? Um, and maybe it does. I, I, I worry that it will take a very long time to turn. So that's not, you know, not, I'm, not I'm not massively optimistic it'll be, it'll be any time soon. But that is probably the more straightforward answer. Um, if we were ever to have a change in electoral system, if we were to have PR, then I think the matter is, is very different. But I, I, you know, the more probable likely outcome that Liberal centre-right values will prevail will be eventually the Conservative Party looks at the electorate, looks that it's, it's lost touch with a large part of the electorate. When you look at you know, how badly Conservative, the Conservative Party is doing with younger voters, you know, it was at 8%, between 18 and 24-year-olds, 13% um, with 25 to 49-year-olds um, on the YouGov polling last week. You know, and, and there's some evidence that this is not just an age thing, this is a cohort thing. Um, you know, the Conservative Party is going to have to go through a massive modernisation programme. I think much harder to do uh, than for David Cameron, you know, when I was, you know, I was a Conservative MP at that time. We were colleagues, Paul, and you know that modernisation program. You know, it, it would be it would be unfair to say you know it was about hugging husky huskies and or whatever it was, or you know hoodies, uh, or taking off ties and things like that. But but you know it didn't fundamentally change quite a lot of the Conservative Party. I think the Conservative Party. I, this is a controversial point. It's on the wrong side of the argument on our relationship with Europe, uh, and you know that is a that is a big, you know that's a big thing for the Conservatives ever to change, given how dependent the Conservative Party has become on essentially you know, Brexit supporting voters. Now that's quite a long answer. What's a long answer? It's a long answer because it's not exactly a conflicted answer but there's lots of conflict in it yes between I think different different feelings yeah. and and, yeah. and and different views but as some of it is you still think the conservative party is the most likely medium term vehicle to deliver center right politics given everything else given the state of the electoral system but you're not a member yes and under what circumstances might you rejoin it's a good, good question i mean the you know, the, the rejoin question is, 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 is one that gets asked in lots of different contexts. Uh, and my sense, and this is a, you know, I, I, sometimes I get asked the question about you know, people who are kind of like-minded and, you know, should I join the Conservative hmm. Party? Rejoin? And I, by and large, say, yes, you should. Uh, but, um, you know, perhaps, you know, do as I say, not necessarily as I, I do. In, in my personal circumstances, I left the Conservative Party uh, in the context of the 2019 general election uh, and um, you know, I, I believe I had very good reasons for doing that. Uh, in a way, I think you can only leave a Conservative Party or leave a political party once. If you get into the habit of doing it, 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 I, I think you sort of people won't take you very, very seriously. So I don't want to sort of you know, rejoin the Conservative Party, and I have got you know some very substantial reservations about the Conservative Party as it stands today. But I am, as I said earlier, pessimistic about where the Conservative Party is going to be 
in a year or two's time. And I really don't want to be doing a kind of political membership hokey-cokey of kind of in, out, in, out. Uh, and, um, you know, until I feel that the Conservative Party is, is, is more likely to be heading in, in a, uh, a trajectory which I find uh, appealing, uh, I'm not going to rush to rejoin. How painful was leaving? It was painful. Um, I, look, I'm not... I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a very good history of the Conservative Party by Robin Harris, which no doubt you have read, Paul, was some mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. But it's got an introductory... Uh, the introduction really struck with me, and it talked about how the Labour Party is is a kind of is a movement and it, it had some various quotes from labor politicians and about the sort of really deep emotional affection for the labor party that, that it had and it goes on to say that you don't get many conservatives who 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 think about it in quite think about the conservative party in quite the same mm. way mm. um and uh, look, you know, the, the whole process for me, it, you know, there were friendships that were ended, there were pers you know, personal relationships, both, you know, with fellow parliamentarians and with members of my constituency association, people who I liked, where there was, you know, there was an end to it. Uh, and, you know, and I always enjoyed coming up to party conference and, and, and all of that. But I, I do think, for, I don't know whether this says more about me, but also a little bit about the Conservative Party, is that I don't think it's a sort of, don't think it's a great sort of sentimental organisation. And I didn't feel that sentimental about the Conservative Party. Individuals, yes. But and the Conservative Party... Your, your local association. Yeah, and, and local, yeah local, individuals in the local, in, 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 yeah, many in the local... So, I mean, a, a large number of them actually came with me and campaigned on my side mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the ones who were sort of particularly angry and disappointed in me you know I, I got over that quite quickly um, that was that was that was yeah that was all right um, uh, if anything that made it all a little easier uh, but um, but I think there is something about the Conservative Party is a means to an end you know and, and let's 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 you know be clear the, the, the point of the Conservative Party is is to deliver power uh, in a way that you know we we want it to be delivered, uh, and you know at that point in 2019, I, I sort of stopped seeing the Conservative Party in that way. Part of the oddity of what's happened is that in the sort of zoology of the Conservative Party, of which I have to be an observer, I, I wouldn't traditionally have put you down automatically as being on the left of the party, which is what some people might assume yeah. if they see this book. It's a kind of manifesto by the Tory left. I mean, I would have put you down until the great earthquake of, of Brexit as a sort of fairly standard centre-right, economically mm. liberal, socially liberal, rather treasury-minded conservative, if anything, when we were in the Commons, maybe slightly to the right of me. Mm. And yet, mm. here you are. You've gone off in one way. Yeah. And, you know, Greg Clark, um, Caroline Noakes, Stephen Hammond... Stephen Bryan, they're all back. Mm. You know, these other members of the, the 21 who had the whip taken away. Yeah, I, you, you are absolutely right. And I, I certainly didn't see myself um, as being on the left of the Conservative Party when I arrived in Parliament. Um, uh, and, you know, to some extent, I, I, I moved a bit. But I, I, you know, I do still consider, you know, the, the, hence the title, I consider myself to be someone on the yeah. centre-right. Uh, yes, socially liberal. Uh, yeah, on that definition I was giving earlier about the you know, the role of the state and 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 yeah that caution and scepticism, I would absolutely sign up to all of that. It was the Brexit issue um, that definitely uh, did it for me, and I felt that the Conservative Party had kind of was was had lost its economic sense uh, and you know my politics had always been driven by you need a strong economy so that you can raise living standards and fund good public services but you have to have the strong economy and sometimes you have to do some you know pretty tough things um and and so on and i i just felt well, we'd kind of we lost our interest in economics this was more about something else uh this was more about 
you know, ideas of sovereignty and nationalism and so on. Uh, and also, I was a sort of believer in strong institutions. I think it was a sort of very strong conservative uh, attribute and you know, rule of law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I saw that being abused. And I felt that the you know, the approach that Boris Johnson took was something I wanted to put some distance between myself and it. Uh, so, so all of those factors move there. And I, I, I mean, sort of, sort of side point. I am sort of slightly struck that when you go back to 2019, that if you look at some of the conservatives who were kind of the the the, the most, if you like, the most anti-Johnson, the most sort of hardline on all of this, if you look at Oliver Letwin or Philip Hammond or myself, none of us really came from the the, the sort of traditional one nation. Tradition, you know, all, all of us had at one point or other sort of been seen to be sort of sort of on the right, um, and I I think there is a slight, if I run the risk of some controversy here, I think there is a slight tendency uh, over the years, over quite a long period of time, of the left of the Conservative Party being too worried about rocking the bows and too worried about being divisive. Uh, and you know, let's let's not have a public row. Let's work on the inside. And after all, the sort of generally the centre left uh, tends to be quite talented and tends to get on, and you know, on the inside. And cabinets and shadow cabinets tend to be dis disproportionately made up of the of the centre left. And it, it it's been too slow to understand how things have changed. Uh, that actually sometimes need sharper elbows and 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 be a little less compromising, uh, and that I think is has, has been a sort of long-standing problem. So I think it's an interesting thing that some of the least compromising, some of the sort of most difficult people, were were those of us who weren't traditionally on on, on the left. And of course, we were the ones who, by and large, didn't get the whips the whip back. I mean, Boris, Boris Johnson, I'm sure, said he didn't. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure the view was he didn't want people getting the whip back who were then going to cause a lot of trouble for him. And I think in my case, he was absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> and in the case of everyone else, and I'm just sort of thinking about the contributors to the book, and the list I'm about to read out is to some degree overlapping, but by my calculation, they're kind of three conservative peers, Michael Heseltine, Daniel Finkelstein and Gavin Barwell, Three people who stood as independents at the last election. It's you, Rory Stewart, and Anne Milton, who did the chapter. Dominic Grieve. And Dominic Grieve's up to four. Right? Rory didn't actually stand. It's, but it's, it's yeah. going up. Yeah. It's going up all the time. Well, Rory considered running as an independent to be mayor of London. Sam Guimard st actually stood as a Lib Dem candidate in Kensington. Four of you, no, it's five, lost the whip. Um, one of you didn't lose the whip, but resigned over the whip being taken away from all the others, namely, namely Amber Run. So, I'm saying this myself at the age of 63, so I'm no spring chicken. But looking at this list, it's on the whole, rather on the older side, yeah, with no MPs, as, as you've said. And as a critic would say, this is a bit of a blast from the past over people who were preoccupied by Brexit. Well, people, I mean, will make that point. And, and to the, the charge of being preoccupied by Brexit, I think, is definitely true in a number of cases. Uh, I, I mean, I think the uh, sort of large majority of us are, for example, un, you know, younger than Keir Starmer. Uh, I, th no, I think... That's not very... Well, that's, you know, I mean, to be honest... Michael Heseltine is the only one old enough to run as an American presidential candidate. <laughs> so, 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 and, uh, you know, I consider myself, you know, I'm in my early 50s, quite a lot of us are of kind of that age. Uh, and so, so, no, I, I you know, and uh, again, volume two, we may sort of spread this out, but I, I, I wanted to sort of focus on, uh, you know, people who, would have some impact in terms of their names, some you know some recognition, uh, and, and and the sort of sense of I mean it was one of one of the contributors but of putting a kind of putting a gang together, um, you know strength strengthens the case, but um, you know as 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 I say you know you know 
I'm, I'm a, I think I'm 10 years younger than Keir Starmer and you know, so is Rory and Gavin and um, so on. And, and even Michael Heseltine is very youthful. <laughs> and has your form of politics, if you put it in an international context, it's not as though what's happened here is unique or even unusual. Uh, I mean, in the world, in America, in, in Germany, where you know the AFD are performing pretty well, in France, where you know the, the Front National are also performing pretty pretty competently. There's a general drift in conservatism, which is culturally to the right and economically to the to the left. Um, so another line of argument about this book would be. This is a tradition that's sort of got left behind by events, and in particular by the pressures of sort of mass immigration and change, about which there was so much debate last week. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, the international point is a very good one, uh, and to some extent Andrew Cooper in his chapter touches upon that and some of the pressures on realignment. Uh, and, and yes, the sort of sense of sort of politics going in the world, well, particularly on the sort of right of politics going sort of culturally to the right and, and, and economically to the left. I, I think the, the, the main point I would make in response to that is, um, well, what, actually two, two points. One on terms of substance. If you worry that actually there are limits to what the state can do, that, 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 um, that a lot of interventions can prove to be counterproductive and not particularly well targeted and efficient uses of money and that there is a role for the market and so on. The, the sort of the, the arguments that conservatives have you know, used in the 1980s and what have you uh, if you believe those things then you know you, you should start to worry about some of the move to the left i mean i, I don't want to overstate it you know we've you know, Michael Heseltine is a contributor and makes the case for industrial strategy, etc. This is not a this is not a sort of small state libertarian uh, piece of work at all. But but you know some of that scepticism about the role of the state in the economy, I think, continues to serve a useful purpose. And I also think that if you want a successful economy, you run into some real difficulties if you go too far down the sort of socially authoritarian route. You know, your immigration policy is also an economic policy. Your relationship with the European Union is also an economic policy. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you go down a particular sort of direction and try and close you all, clo you know, become a, if you like, uh, endorse closed values, I think that's going to make you a less successful economy. So that, the sort of first point is on the sort of substance, is mm. that it might not be fashionable, it doesn't make it wrong. No. Um, the second point is, an, an, a less important, but is the electoral one. And you know, I think there is a real, you know, if, 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 if the Conservative Party and other parties of the centre-right essentially have a sort of set of values and a sort of an approach that, that repels uh, educated voters when the proportion of graduates in amongst the electorate is growing all the time you are endlessly sort of shrinking uh, your potential voter base and actually returning to substance you're also going to start losing some economic arguments that you shouldn't be losing you know that the center right it just gets written off of everything uh, because it just you know, repels those voters. And if you want to get a hearing on arguments about why you know, market capitalism is the right form of, of economy, uh, if you're doing that at the same time as espousing views on social issues that are just seem to be beyond the pale, you're not going to get a hearing. You're going to lose those arguments. And, and, and you know, there are real risks that you know, we end up going in the wrong direction on both economic and social policy. I think a counter-argument, which is both a sort of half a moral argument and half an electoral argument, would be something like this. This sounds like, pretty much, um, the programme of David Cameron in opposition and the coalition in government. Electorally, David Cameron didn't manage to win a majority in 2010, got a majority of 12, I think, in 2015. So does it look to be substantial 
electoral support for this in terms of something that would deliver you a majority of 50, 60, 70, the kind of majority you need these days mm. to get much legislation through. And a critic would say it sounds a bit like a kind of return to a form of politics that is rather southern-based, it's fine in London, service economy, you have quite a bit of immigration to sort of grease the wheels, but there's nothing much in it for the newer voters who came in in 2019. What's your counter counter yeah. argument to that? Um, I think the first point, uh, yeah, I, I, I take your point that um, you know, David Cameron didn't win a big majority. I think if you were to ask the leadership of the Conservative Party if they'd accept a majority of 12 in a general election next year, they'd probably bite your hand off. Um, I, I think the, I mean, the starting point does, I think, have to be about what is right for the country. I mean, I think it's a perfectly legitimate question about does this give you uh, enough to win a majority, but I think your starting point has to be, uh, you know, is that good for the country? I think you also have to look at how the electorate is changing with a growing proportion of people who have been to university, who will have more socially liberal values. And we are, you know, it's pretty clear, we are a more socially liberal uh, country today than we were in 2010, uh, even though our politics has perhaps moved in a different direction. But you, know, you, you can look at the you know, survey of public attitudes. Um, and, and I think, you know, to some extent, the Conservative Party needs to think about where the electorate is, not just where it was in 2010 or where it was in 2019 or even where it is today but where it is going and I think there is a real risk that you know, centre-right politics could become marginalised uh, because, because it's not it's not recognising how things are changing and the, the focus, and this is why it's really difficult for the Conservative Party, oh, I recognise the dilemma, why I think a call vote strategy that I think we're hearing at the moment a little bit from the party leadership in the short term probably makes sense because you're just trying to hold up, you know, trying to move from 25 to 30 percent of the vote. But at the same time, you're going to make it harder and harder to sort of win back the sort of people in the in the sort of in their 20s. I mean, I now, you know, I now, now um, spend most of my time working with a city law firm. Uh, and I'll bet when I was a, you know, a, City law firm. It had not very good time for the uh, for the Conservatives in the sort of mid and late nineties. A lot of young city lawyers would have been still would have been Tory voters. I don't think that's the case anymore. You know, I don't think the people who I work with in a city law firm vote Conservative. Now these are the best paid people of their cohort, uh, and if it's happening there, you know, it's it's happening much much more broadly. And I think. Yeah, the Conservative Party is, is, is in a cul-de-sac. At this point, I think, I mean, everyone's listening quite rapt. I think I ought to bring some people in to ask questions of David. So I'm going to take two at a time. Um, if you could identify yourselves, I'd be very grateful. So who, who's first? I'm going to take the lady there, and then... Yes, I'll take you again. Um, the microphone's coming, so over to you. Conservative One Nation group that I think you actually came to our Zoom call at the beginning yeah. of lockdown. Um, an awful lot of us agree very much with what you've said is that we believe politics is about the economy. The drift, sorry, uh, the drift towards the centre right is alienating us. Uh, no, the, the you know the, the alt right. The problem is, is that as you pointed out that the Conservative Party is also going socially, uh, economically towards the left, social. So is the Labour Party. So where are those of us who are economically right going to go? We're completely politically homeless. And we need people like you who have written this book to come back in. Because when I talk to people, our friends, both sides of the political spectrum, we more or less agree, but there's nobody in the economic ground. Politics is going towards cultural issues, not the economy, which is where I'm sure it always used to be and still should be, in my view. I don't know yeah. if you've got any answers. Yeah, and we'll take the second. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm Julian Gallant. I'm the uh, 
group leader on Ealing Council, and I'm one of those sort of London, I consider myself a centre-right, a sort of absolute centre-right, but pretty hard-right on law and order. Um, so in your model of a, of a, of a sort of centrist, rightist person, um, is there room for, for being for, for variation? <laughs> um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, you, you're, you're trying to define the undefinable, really, aren't you? Yeah, it's, I mean, on those two points, I mean, look, you know, it, it's um, that sense of politics moving away from economics, I, I think, is at the heart of this. Um, and, and look, you know, I, I you know, want to reiterate, well, this, is, this is not a sort of hard right libertarian slash taxes, you know, to the extent that sort of themes come through, there's, there's you know, fiscal responsibility, caution on all of that, there is a role for the state, but, you know, it's very much wanting a, a thriving private sector, and I, you know, I, I the, you know, the Boris Johnson remark about business, which I'm not going to repeat, um, but the, the kind of, the very casual attitude to business concerns that we saw over the Brexit period, I think is really damaging, and, 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 and the Conservatives' reputation has not fully recovered uh, on, on that particular uh, front. I do think people feel homeless. It, it's very hard for the reasons that you know, we've talked about under the first part of the system first part of the post system. I do think there is a gap there. I think there's a gap that the Liberal Democrats could take but are not taking. Um, uh, in the end, I think, you know, it's sort of uh, nature pours a vacuum and all of that sort of thing, that, that, that it will be answered. Um, I don't claim that the book is, you know, solves all the problems. It's necessary but not sufficient, but it is a sort of start, start articulating what the sort of centre right is about, and in terms of sort of law and order, uh, as a point, look, I, as, as a justice secretary, I was sort of unashamedly a liberal figure. Uh, I hope that hasn't shocked anybody there. Um, <laughs> but it, it, in in the sense of wanting to sort of focus on rehabilitation, but certainly what drove me was a desire to reduce crime, uh, and you know the, one of the biggest problems that we have with our criminal. Uh, justice system is repeat offenders uh, and if you can reduce recidivism that is a very good way of reducing crime so crime is committed by a relatively small number of people um, uh, they, they sort of put them in prison for a few months and then let them out and let's see what happens is a model that doesn't work um, and a model that that is you know hard-headed uh, involves discipline. Again, Rory was my prisons minister. You know, he was very much rightly so in favour of better discipline in prisons uh, and that you know, the prison officers would be in control, but it would be the environment in which he could then have uh, uh, greater rehabilitation. And so getting that criminal justice system is right. But again, you know, a, a way of approaching this is about trade-offs. This is about recognising that there are competing purposes within our criminal justice system um, but you know fundamentally what are we about we are about reducing the level of crime and let's take a kind of hard-headed practical approach to trying to reduce that and what about coming back yeah. uh, coming back yeah. Yeah. The, the well um, the, the, uh, sort of the uh, I'm, I'm I'm quite enjoying my post uh, political life uh, but look, I, you know, I, I have a sort of, you know, I think all of us want to still contribute and find a way of co contributing. Uh, I've done that by writing, and I obviously have the great privilege of writing for Con Home as well to go out and uh, make that argument. Who knows what the future will will hold? Uh, but um, I've had one go at running as an independent, and it was a terrific experience until they counted the votes. <laughs> Who would like to see David back in the Conservative Party? Well, no pressure. All right. Okay. All right. Um, interesting. Um, so two more. Who have we... Sunder and yeah, the lady at the front. Sunder. Thanks. Um, David, Sunder Katwala from British Future, the think tank. Uh, do you think you've got foundational political differences with Keir Starmer? Um, I'd be interested, you, you must admire, you know, he's got a party that was hard left and looked like it was there, he got it to the centre left. But what, what about his national agenda? Do you, do you sort of admire it or do you think you think very differently about it? And, uh, yeah. Hi. Um, 
My name's Fran, I'm from the Dignity in Dying campaign, and I wanted to ask you about issues of social conscience, such as assisted dying or um, women's bodily autonomy or LGBT rights, and what does the Conservative Party moving further to the right mean for those? All right, okay. Um, actually, I'll start with that and then come to... Uh, um, I mean, I think rightly these these issues are left to free votes, on, on most, certainly most of those are left to free votes. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm supportive of the uh, campaign on dignity dying, and I think we should look again at that, and uh, I think Parliament will... Uh, uh, yeah, I suspect Parliament will do so before that much longer, and, and as you know much better than I do, you're looking around the world, uh, there is a you know, there is a move in a particular direction. Um, but I think that, that that doesn't necessarily sort of fit neatly in the kind of left-right sort of spectrum. Say so I, I favour reform, but you know there are figures. So you know obviously Kit Malthouse, perhaps more on the sort of traditional right, but is an enthusiastic enthusiast for reform in this area. Um, uh, but but um, you know, m I, I would argue that a more liberal direction on that front would be would be very much welcome. Uh, and you know, notwithstanding, I think there has been a, con a cultural move on some issues. I suspect the next time uh, there is a vote in Parliament, there'll be much much more support for reform in this area than we saw um, when you know, we, Parliament last voted, whatever it was in 2016, was it? I can't. Remember. 15. Um, in terms of Keir Starmer, I mean, I'm slightly, I, 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 on this issue, and maybe on this issue alone, I'm in touch with the electorate, I think, in that I'm not entirely sure I know what Keir Starmer really believes. Uh, I do think he has clearly moved the Labour Party a long way. Uh, there are a number of uh, people in the shadow cabinet who I admire and I think would make very good ministers. Uh, but I don't really at heart know what what he is about, and I do still consider myself to be a sort of figure of the of the, of the centre right. Uh, and I think, you know, there the, there is there is more conf you know, he has more confidence that the state will be able to find solutions to some of the big problems that we have than than than, than I have. And I think there's also again it's a point that Danny makes in his chapter. Uh, you know, when you choose centre right or centre left, you're also choosing which allies you're having. You know, who who else is part of your coalition? Uh, and I I still you know, worry about some of the elements of the sort of Labour coalition. Uh, uh, you know that that's that's you know not not for me. Uh, I would say this as and I think I would say this even if I was still a Conservative MP. If Keir Starmer wins the next general election, you know I wish him well. You know, I want him to succeed for the country. I mean, I, whoever's you know, whoever is in power, I want them to succeed for the for the country. He's clearly a figure of the of the centre, but I think he is of the centre left, and I think there is a to use your word a foundational difference. Let's have two more. So you to there and the lady back, the blue. Uh, thank you, David, and I'm from your. Old constituency Indeed. of Southwest yeah. Hearts. I've just got a, a question. I, is not the term centre right just a bit of a market employ? Because everyone knows that if you say you're right wing, certainly if you say you're very right wing, then people have certain thoughts as to your, your moral integrity. And um, I disagree with you, as you probably know, on a number of matters. But I would think I'm quite centre and I probably just wouldn't want to say I'm right so is my question is just is this not just a bit of marketing from those that have the same opinion as yourself no, no oh sorry I'm going to take yeah sorry, that, that Andrew yes David and tonight uh, good to see you again um, my, quest, my question uh, is this is that you've touched on our first past the post system and one of the differences that you can argue between our system and one of proportional representation is that we kind of form our coalitions before we go to the polls as opposed to after. So as making a case as you are doing for the centre right, do you not think that you would be more successful by making that case from within the party rather than from outside where it could be seen as either fringe or even 
divisive when it is neither, or you intend it to be neither? Yeah. Um, no, well, thank you both for, the, for, for those questions. I think in terms of the title, I mean, we did consider liberal centre-right, the case for the liberal centre-right, to try to sort of distinguish it. Uh, but I think that was felt to be one word too long uh, for, a, for a book title. Uh, and, um, I mean, in a way, I think, I think you're, sort of, you're sort of slightly making my point for me, the fact that people feel, oh, I wouldn't want to be called right-wing, I'd rather be called centre-right, is... is is I think a bit of the problem because well, I mean I think I think that's right, but I, th I think it reveals a problem for the Conservative Party, which is seen as being right wing, um, and that 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 is you know that that sort of slight sort of cringe feel is a problem that the Conservative Party is going to have to overcome at the next general election, and it probably won't. Um, and you know that that's the case for for being you know more demonstrably in the centre ground of British politics. And on Angela's um, question, uh, look, I, I tell you, I, I um, yeah, I won't repeat what I sort of said earlier about you know rushing to rejoin uh, the party, having left in particular circumstances, and with a pessimistic view, at least about the short term, about where the Conservative Party is 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 going to go. Um, but given where I was uh, and where I am, uh, I thought I could still make a contribution and more to the point, get a contribution from a number of people who are still members of the party, others who are not. But yeah, there, is a, there is a body of opinion that is you know, that's either in the Conservative Party, some in the Liberal Democrats, some no party whatsoever, it gets reflected within this room, that have quite a lot in common, and you know, the more that we can do to kind of articulate that and, and create a force behind that, uh, then I think the, the the better the chance that ultimately those values can be um, more prominent in our public life and more influential within government. Two more there, the lady there, and oh. guy in the corner. Yeah, the Guardian. Um, those of us journalists here perhaps were hoping for a bit of a punch up. Uh, that somebody was oh, going to take. Oh, sorry, Polly. But you seem to be here entirely amongst friends, um, uh, 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 and people, you know, on your side or otherwise. I'm very disappointed. Very quiet. <laughs> um, I just wondered how many you think there are of One Nation people amongst MPs, even if they're not declaring themselves now, because it's very difficult. Um, and how many amongst members? I mean, how high a mountain have you got to climb? Very good. I'll take the... Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm David Gray. I'm a county councillor in Gloucestershire. Um, one, in terms of the sort of nomiculture, one thing that always winds me up is the um, the sort of... For example, I think that Rory Stewart on his podcast gifting the idea that left is progressive. So, you know, may I make a suggestion that rather than centre-right, progressive right might be uh, a more positive way of spinning it. Um, well, I think we, we're getting lots of um, suggestions on the title, and uh, <laughs> to be fair, the title, the title proved to be sort of one of the hardest issues of the whole process, um, which I understand from more experienced authors is not unusual, uh, and, and I think it's a sort of use, useful debate to be had. I, I, yeah, I, we can, yeah, I think centre right does convey what we're uh, about. It does seem to be upsetting one or two people who are sort of saying you're kind of colonising the centre right, and it. And to come back to Polly's point, maybe we're upsetting the right people. So, so it was a small amount of a punch, punch up. Uh, on the reception, I should say, as Paul mentioned, this is the first time I've been to party conference since 2019. And I had had one or two comments of sort of people, oh, you're brave and so on. But I did come in 2019 having just lost the Conservative whip and where I was demonstrably trying to do everything I could to stop the recently elected leader of the Conservative Party do what he wanted to do. And the response I got at uh, many functions was extraordinarily courteous and so on. Uh, so, so I think, you know, Polly, there is a, there is a mountain to climb in terms of where uh, the bulk of the Conservative Party membership is in terms of its attitudes. You can just look at um, 
the votes in the recent leadership elections, whether it's Liz Truss last year or Boris Johnson in 2019, um, it, it is still my view, although I might disagree with them and they might disagree with me, is that the vast majority of Conservative Party members are very decent, honest and uh, courteous people. Uh, and that's so far been my experience, but I've only been in Manchester for a few hours. <laughs> Where do you think all this is going? I mean, after all, there was a Prime Minister last year who conducted an economic experiment. Um, it was not a tremendous success economically. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not a tremendous success politically. Um, on yes. Politico poll of polls, um, that leader left with the Conservatives on, on 23 points. Um, but, you know, there is a view abroad that actually my perception of those events and that of some others is mistaken, that in fact it was in some way some sort of fledgling success, but it was a failure because of the OBR or the WEF or the Bank of England or something of which, with respect, you're almost an embodiment, which is Treasury orthodoxy, mm, yes. and that actually the whole thing is really ought to be a, a great success and if the Conservatives return to it after the next election whatever guys it will be a great success do you feel that reverberating around this conference in the Conservative world or is it really essentially noise it's um it, it's hard to judge about this conf this conference as I say I've only really just arrived and it'll be interesting to see how many people go along to this rally for growth or whatever You're not tomorrow. I'm not speaking, uh, or indeed, uh, I'm not planning on attending. Um, uh, you're not either, Paul. I, I, not at the moment. Not at the moment. We have a very busy schedule. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, it, I mean, but there's clearly an, an element of it out there, and and you know, Paul, we were you know, come from slightly different positions, but but I suspect we've largely. Well, I know both written about this a lot, and 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 have a lot of common ground here. Um, but it does worry me that one of the possible outcomes for the Conservative Party in opposition is that it will go down the route of, of, of believing in this sort of rather magical view of supply-side reforms uh, and, you know, cut taxes and it'll pay for itself. And, of course, if you do that in opposition, as opposed to when you're in government, you don't suffer the immediate consequences you don't you don't collide with reality in the way that Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng collided so spectacularly with reality uh, last year and it's of course nothing to do with these various institutions Treasury Orthodoxy and uh, you know, the World Economic Forum and the Bank of England and the OBR you know these are just representatives of, of you know of reality all the markets um, uh, you know, this is this is this is this is just sort of you know, practical, real world experience, and you know that is that was a, such a spectacular mistake. Is that I hope lessons have been learned, but I I I worry that you know that, I think those lessons are more obviously learnt in the Labour Party and less clearly learnt in the Conservative Party. And if that is the case, um, then the Labour Party has an opportunity to to sort of prevail on fiscal responsibility and you know, economic trust with us. You know, if, if, that, if the Conservatives lose that argument, then they are in very, very deep trouble. And if the Conservative Party, after the next election, fully embraces it again, then they are going to be in opposition for a very long time. Well, look, apologies to everyone, because we've run out of time. But I want to say two things um, in closing. Um, the first is that it's terrific having you as a columnist, because um, I found having, I'd like to think, discovered you um, as a columnist, that you're both quite angry and frustrated about lots of things that have happened, but you're too rational to let those things get the better of you. So you get a really interesting column with these two things mixing around. The other is that um, I'm very grateful to have had this conversation. It goes without saying, I don't agree with everything in the book. But Mrs. Thatcher once said a bird needs two wings. And there's got to be space in the Conservative Party for this particular wing. Or it, it won't do historically what it always has done in taking a broad enough coalition on board to, to win elections and get stuff done. So, David, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
uh, two till three, so just to finish the advert. Thank you, Paul. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yes.